What if you could step back in time and talk with some of Kansas City's most historic figures? The innovators and achievers who left their mark on our town, on our nation. What would you ask if you could meet the past? This week, Crosby crosses swords with John Brown, the Bible-quoting abolitionist, some would say terrorist, who brought his holy war against slavery to Kansas and to the nation. The Civil War started here, on the border between Kansas and Missouri. Bleeding Kansas, Jayhawkers, Bushwhackers, Free Staters, Border Ruffians, slaves. We redefined freedom here, but there was a cost. And tonight, to talk about the truth of that cost, we have the prophet himself, old John Brown, Osawatomie Brown. Please welcome John Brown. Well, welcome back to Kansas, Kansas City. Thank you. This is an unusual experience for me to get such a warm welcome here in Missouri. <laughs> the last time I was here, the, the welcome was not warm. It was hot. Where, where did this passion of yours, the passion that set, set the country ablaze, where did this come from, your hatred of slavery? I learned what slavery really meant from my father, Owen Brown. He was an abolitionist when there were few abolitionists. And he taught me and he taught all of my siblings that slavery was an abomination. And in 1812, the War of 1812 is going on and your father was a purveyor of cattle and other things to uh, General Hull. And there's a story about about you as a, as a young man uh, herding cattle to, uh, to, to, to General Hull and an experience there that might have had an impact on you. I was staying with a man who had a slave, a 12-year-old boy, my age. And I treated him well because he was my equal. But he wasn't used to that, so we quickly became friends. And one night, the man, I, he became enraged enraged with the boy, and he walked over to the, to the fireplace and picked up the metal coal shovel and walked over to the boy and began beating him with it. He beat him bloody right in front of my eyes. I then knew what slavery really meant. It meant that the slave did not own their very existence. Someone else did and could end it at any time. I decided I would work against slavery from that moment on. And it was the time of the Second Great Awakening uh, in, in the United States, and, and that must have had a, a, an influence on you, an impact on, on your view of the world. Uh, I was extremely religious. I believed literally in God's word and that God had a plan for everyone. You, you told George Stearns later on, one of, the, one of the secret six who supported you from New England, that there were two things that had always guided you. The golden yes. rule. And the Declaration of Independence. The Declaration. Both said the same thing. All men are created equal. It does not say some men are created equal and others have dominion over them. And do unto others as you would have them do unto you. That is not the slavery motto. It said that uh, you, you had 20 different careers before you, before you became take, this calling. Uh, you had ran a tannery, you were involved in real estate, you were a shepherd, you were a horse breeder, a lumber dealer. Well, you had these many careers, and, and so there must have been, been a moment in, in your life as, as the United States grows and slave population grows and the dissonance between the South and the North grows. What was important to you? 1837 strikes me as a, a year that might have been important to you. Yes, yes. It was the year that Elijah Lovejoy, the abolitionist, publisher was killed for, de for publishing. He, he was defending his press. He'd already lost several presses into the river. Chased out of St. Louis, Missouri. Chased out of St. Louis up to, to Alton, Alton Illinois, Illinois, a free state where he should have been safe, but the citizens there 
were afraid that the good citizens of St. Louis wouldn't trade with them if they thought it was an abolitionist town. So they came and threw his type and presses in the river. He was shot dead, dead, <laughs> defending his press. And that had an effect on me that sh the war was continuing and it was getting worse. There's another famous moment in the history of, uh, of, uh, of, of race, race relations in, in, in America. The Amistad slave ship yes, yes. is captured by, yes. by a man whom you admired, Sank, the, the, uh, uh, the leader of the, the, the African slaves on that ship, and is, and is brought to Boston, and, uh, and, and there's a great, a great trial. It showed me. It showed me, it gave me an idea, a partial idea, a, the, the glimmering of an idea that Slaves would fight for their freedom. Slaves would fight to liberate themselves. And at that time, Frederick Douglass, who of course becomes the most famous ex-slave in American uh, history, visits your farm. 1847, this is 1847, still 13 years before the, the Civil War begins. But tell us about Frederick Douglass's visit to your North Elba farm, well, far up in the First off, I was Mountains. extremely, extremely happy that, Fre that, that Frederick came to visit. He was my good friend my whole life. I discussed a little about what my thoughts were. I opened a map and, and showed him the Adirondacks. And then that's where we were. And then I showed the Appalachians. And I showed him certain areas. And I told him that God had put them there to help end slavery, because I believe that they were there for a purpose. God put the Appalachian Mountains down so that slavery could be ended and perhaps be ended by you. I was thinking. By the way, Frederick Douglass was a little skeptical, I'm told, of, uh, he, uh, of this plan yes, to end, he was, end he was slavery in the Appalachians. My, uh, he was concerned for my mental uh, state, I believe, but and, and this, he this, got over it. You, you, you were reading at this time li A Life of Wellington. You were talking about the Peninsular Wars. You, you were talking about Haiti and, and, uh, and what had gone on in, in, in Jamaica and the Seminoles in Florida. Yes. What was that all about? Like the Amistad, it was oppressed people rising up on their own and taking back that which had been kept from them for so long. People that most Americans thought were not even people. This is not long after Nat Turner's rebellion. Yes. And, and it showed that slave rebellion was possible. And slaves were willing to fight for their freedom and die if necessary. You pick this, this moment uh, to, uh, to, to, to bring together uh, a group of, of people, uh, mostly, mostly black, but some, uh, some white, uh, and, and form the League of Gileadites. I don't know if I'm pronouncing that cor correctly, but one of your favorite passages, I understand, in the, in the Bible is Gideon on, on Mount Gilead. And what, what was the League all about? What is this, this uh, fascination with Gideon blowing his horn on the mount? Lighting the way for someone else to, to, to show them that have lost their way or have never had their way to find their way to the promised land, to what, where they should go, where America should go. America was, America had lost its way. It, it was never going to be, never going to be what it could be with slavery. And, and it said when you formed this League of, uh, of Gilead and, and, and 44 blacks and 12 whites and you talked for the first time about an uprising, about the overthrow of the system of, uh, of slavery, that this is the first time in American history that a white man uh, to a public group advocated the overthrow uh, of slavery. And, uh, yes. and, and, and yet you're a patriot at the same time. Yes. How can you reconcile these two things? You want to There's, overthrow the entire system of the country. I wanted to overthrow the slave system in the country. The country itself only needed modification, amendment. The Constitution was a divinely inspired document that had some of the devil in it. 
Did you really live the life? I mean, when Douglas came or Richard Henry Dana got lost in the yes. Appalachians at one point on a, on a trip and he showed up at your farm uh, quite by accident, uh, the author of uh, Two Years Before the Mast, one of the great American classics, and he shows up just wandering into your farm. What does he find? I was strange to people because I sat down to eat with blacks. I served them at my table. I treated them as if they were as good as I. That was insanity during that time for any white man to think that. And one of your biographers, W.E.B. Du Bois, said that you, you uh, were not simply for, but with black men. I think that's a great tribute to you. They were my brothers. Frederick Douglass is a very good example how intelligent white men could not look at Frederick Douglass and understand that the only reason slaves were ignorant was because they had not been taught anything. Something new happens in America. Stephen Douglass uh, induces us to pass uh, the Kansas-Nebraska Act. Uh, and all of a sudden, Kansas, which had been uh, designated a free, uh, a potential free state, is up for grabs. It's popular sovereignty, and, and your sons go off to Kansas. Now, there's some debate about whether or not your sons, and then you follow them, wh whether or not they and you went to Kansas uh, for uh, real estate speculation. One has to make a living. Good, yes, I agree with that. One makes a living the way one can. And in a new territory, real estate is about the only thing that exists. There, there, there's obviously a huge fight going on between the, the free staters and the, and the slave staters, between Bleeding the Kansas, Missourians Bleeding Kansas, the Eastern press called it. Bleeding Kansas. And there's this moment then w w when they do actually sack Lawrence. Yes. The, tell us about that, the sack of Lawrence. We were living in Brown Station on Pottawatomie Creek. My, I was with my sons. They had established the, established the settlement there. On the 19th of May, I received word that, from back east that my father had died and had been buried on my 56th birthday. I would have liked to have mourned him, but word came that Lawrence was about to be attacked. I got my sons together and a few other men, and we, we rode north, heading for Lawrence, trying to get there in time. We're approaching. We're not anywhere near Lawrence, but we're, in, we're heading in that direction when we're met by a rider from Lawrence who said hey, we were too late. The town had been attacked by four to 600 pro-slavery men under the direction and, and leadership of the sheriff of Douglas County who was pro-slavery. They sacked and burned the town. Is that what led to what is now associated with your name forever to, to the events in Pottawatomie? I suppose you speak of the Pottawatomie so-called massacre. Slavery is a war raged by the slave owners against the slaves. That war started 250 years before the so-called massacre and had continued and escalated with every human being enslaved. It escalated when the pro-slavery people raided Lawrence, the headquarters of the Free State Movement. It escalated when Charles Sumner was beaten on the floor of the United States Senate for speaking out against slavery in Kansas. The Bible has many verses that say those who support slavery should be put to death. Prior to this massacre, most who died in Kansas were pro-freedom, not pro-slavery. The pro-slavery powers needed to know that something was going on against what they were doing. They were not going to have free reign in Kansas anymore. Is this the Christian attitude, Mr. Brown? Read your Bible. You will find many instances of much, much more violence than occurred at Pottawatomie. This was not a random act against innocent farmers. These men had done much already, including threatened the lives of women and children 
These were not innocents. These were warriors in the war. What, what actually happened to the Doyles and the Shermans and Alan Wilkinson? Five pro-slavery men dragged out of their beds at night and hacked to death with broadswords. The broadswords? Why the broadswords? Why not just shoot them? Pro-slavery men were superstitious. They realized this was not just an attack. It was God's wrath upon them. The Civil War really begins in 1856. Correct. The Battle of Blackjack Correct. is the first battle of the, of the Civil War, and you are the leader. A 24-year-old Virginian named Henry Clay Pate who had been in the sack of Lawrence and helped burn the town, got himself appointed deputy United States Marshal to get old Brown. He got himself a group of, of Missourians together, called themselves Shannon Sharpshooters, about 70 men, 70 men. They were barely men, they were boys. On June 1st, he was camped at Blackjack Springs Campground, a popular campground on the Santa Fe Trail. They have a fortified position. They have wagons circled over there. And they outnumber us three to one. Military doctrine says you don't attack a fortified position unless you have three to one odds in your favor. Well, wait. Wait until they're not ready. As it was getting light, we approached, and I was surprised. Pate was smart enough to have had put sentries out. One of them saw us, fired at us. He retreated. We came up on the high ground on the west. They couldn't hit us with their weapons. We were too far. They didn't shoot far enough, so they moved down to the creek on one side, and we moved down to the creek on the other, a Y-shaped creek. We were on one, out, one arm, they were on the other, and we began firing across at each other. But it wasn't flat. The creeks have steep slopes on both sides, and so you could duck down behind them and pop back up to fire. My men did that. They'd pop down and move and pop back up in a different place. Pate couldn't count and find out how many men we had so or how thought, few. So he thought you had more men than you He did. thought we were a huge army. And your son Frederick, Frederick intervened in the battle. Frederick, who was a little mentally challenged, I understand. Frederick, Frederick. It's, it's said Frederick. There, there's, there's, there are rumors about the, uh, the sanity of the Brown family. I, I hate to bring that up at this Frederick point. Frederick had no mental problems. He, he had seizure disorders, and he had severe debilitating headaches. He had good spells and bad spells, but he was a bright boy. And he was at Blackjack. Yeah, he wanted so to be he, with us. He, he's, he intervenes all of a sudden in the middle of this he, battle. He's taking care of our horses. I didn't want him on the front lines. And suddenly, about three hours into the battle, I hear a noise up, up the creek, just a, a few yards. And out of the creek rides Frederick on his brother's horse, right out into the middle, and turns and rides right down between the firing lines, waving his saber over his head, shouting, Father, we have them surrounded and have cut off their lines of communication and rides off. It was a seizure at that, uh, that very moment. I never asked him. We did not speak of it. And, 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 I thought and, he had seizures. And so, and so it, it, obviously, Pate, Pate thought at he this was a point, vanguard. yeah, he, he might be in trouble, so there, there's a parley. Yes, Pate thought he was the vanguard of the, uh, the, of the free state reinforcements that were coming, so he puts up a white flag and tries to talk. He was a 24-year-old puke. He sticks his finger in my nose practically, and t starts telling me that I am a United States Marshal, and you are in violation of my authority, and I have a warrant for the arrest of certain persons. And if you do not do this, and if you don't do this, eventually, I informed him that he was my prisoner. <laughs> he did not like that. He said, you do not violate the flag of truce in fair warfare. And I said, warfare has no rules, and you are my prisoner. And there's another battle pretty immediately after, the Battle of, uh, of Osawatomie, in which, again, you're, you're outnumbered, and, and though you're chased off the battlefield, and Osawatomie uh, itself is, is raised. These two battles, and the death of Frederick, and ultimately the death of your son John, John Jr., they, they make you a legend in, in, in the country. And, and you go to New England, and you speak to these groups that include Ralph Waldo Emerson and, and uh, Thoreau. Show them what they do to them that do not believe in freedom. 
and you raised money from these folks called the Secret Six, yes. uh, Franklin Sanborn and Thomas Wentworth Higgins and Garrett Smith, Theodore Parker, the great uh, uh, ab abolitionist. Um, Wise men who saw the truth in what I was doing. There, there is this distinction in, in the country between those who, who like Lincoln and, 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 uh, and others are looking for a peaceful solution and those who, like you, believe that there is no peaceful solution. To many people, the peaceful solution was the status quo. The status quo in which four million human beings were in bondage. Four million. Nothing was too much to end that. You organized the money and you organized men uh, to join you in an assault on Harper's Ferry, uh, Virginia. What was so important about Harper's Ferry? What was the symbolism, what was the reality of Harper's Ferry? It was on the, the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad. It was an armory. It was in the north, very close to free territory. It is interesting to me, it's in Virginia, so it's an attack in a, in a slave-holding state. But it's also the federal government. It's yes. an attack on the federal government, the government of the United States. I was not attacking my country. The slave powers had all the government. We were simply trying to get some of the government munitions and stores to fight against that slave power, that control the government. And you capture the armory and the arsenal and the rifle works and the fire station, and, and then what happens? I allowed a train to proceed instead of holding it hostage. I was concerned that no innocent people die, although... Ironically... Ironically, yes. The first casualty at Harper's Ferry is... A black man. A black one of my baggage brothers, handler. One of my brethren. We stay too long. And the militia comes out much faster, much faster than I thought they would. Militias from all, as well as regular troops from all over Virginia and yes. Washington commanded, the ultimate commander is Robert E. Lee. Yes, he, he leads the Marines that take over from the militia. And they finally, they finally break into the fire station where you are and, and, and they think they've killed you, but they haven't. No, God preserved me. I was wounded rather severely, but God had other other plans for me. I believed up until that moment that my, my destiny was to live and lead the slave army to fight for their freedom. God did not intend me to live to fight slavery. He intended me to die to fight slavery. And, and I resolved to do that. So you were stoical about, about this. You were ready to accept your fate. Uh, but there's I one... Welcomed my, I welcomed it. I believed it was what had to be done. At, during my trial, some of my misguided friends tried to get my attorney to uh, plead insanity. That'll get you off. They won't hang an insane man. We'll try to find some insanity in your family, and, and, and we'll say, you're insane. And I said, no, I'm not insane. If I say I'm insane, what does that do to every word I've ever spoken? All men are brothers, ravings of a lunatic. I would not do that. I could not do that. You, you went to the gallows and you went stoically, giving presents to your jailers. Yes. And. And I handed a piece of paper to my jailer as, as I left. Do you remember what you wrote yes, on that? Yes, I do. I, John Brown, am now quite convinced that the crimes of this guilty land will never be purged away but with blood. I had, as I now think, vainly flattered myself that without very much bloodshed it might be done. A reckoning was coming. The whirlwind was coming, and America would feel it. John Brown did not do that. Every man who owned a slave did that. 
your last words to the jailer as you were brought to the gallows was, this is a beautiful country. Yes. A beautiful country in which you had created a cataclysm, in which the question of means and ends is a question that we will always contemplate. That cataclysm started here in Kansas. It started in blood. It ended in freedom by the hand of John Brown. Ladies and gentlemen, John Brown. John Brown is significant to the local history, but he's also significant to national history because the people we are now is in a large part because of what John Brown started back then. And that makes him significant to us today and to our uh, future generations. To learn more about John Brown, reading lists and more can be found at the Kansas City Public Library or at kclibrary.org.